SpaceX is in the final phase of preparing Starship 25 and Super Heavy Booster 9 for their integrated flight test. After destacking the vehicle on October 5th, team spent more than a week performing fixes on Booster 9, mainly focusing on the outside and inside of its aft section. Although it wasn't clear what exactly they did, it can be assumed that they made some minor modifications and upgrades to the booster that needed to be done before it was ready for liftoff. The hot stage ring on top of the booster was removed on October 9th, and it was the second time the ring was removed from the booster after its installation in August. After removing the hot stage ring, a platform was constructed out to the booster from the Starship's quick disconnect arm, allowing personnel to access the top of the booster. The top of the booster forward dome houses grid fin actuators, avionics, and associated components. The removal of the hot stage ring allowed teams to access the top of the booster and make any necessary hardware fixes. After completing works on Booster 9, on October 15, teams removed the scaffolding installed on the launch mount and reinstalled the hot stage ring on Booster 9 with the help of a crane. The following day, Ship 25 was lifted with the help of launch tower arms and placed atop Booster 9 to complete the full stack. Immediately after that, SpaceX posted on X that they were preparing for a launch rehearsal, hinting that a full stack wet dress rehearsal was imminent. However, things did not go according to SpaceX's plan, as they could not connect the ship's quick disconnect umbilical to Ship 25 due to some issues with the mechanism on the ship's side. Teams spent the next several hours working to fix the issue by climbing onto the quick disconnect arm, but all those efforts were in vain. A day later, Ship 25 was destacked from Booster 9 for teams to work on fixing the issues with the quick disconnect. Over the next two days, Ship 25 and Quick Disconnect Umbilical received a number of repairs and upgrades. Workers were also seen inspecting the welds on Booster 9, especially at stringers on the forward dome, using special weld inspection tools. Finally, on 20 October, after all repairs and inspections were completed, Ship 25 was lifted and restacked atop Booster 9. The Quick Disconnect Umbilical was then successfully connected to the ship, confirming that the repairs were successful. The full stack wet dress rehearsal is the next milestone for Ship 25 and Booster 9. The wet dress rehearsal test will simulate a launch day scenario, except for the ignition of the rocket's engines. It will involve fully loading propellants into the booster and ship, followed by a launch countdown rehearsal. During the countdown, SpaceX would ensure all systems work correctly right up to the engine ignition. The vehicle will be detanked after the rehearsal. While Starship is nearly ready for the second integrated flight test from a technical standpoint, SpaceX is yet to receive the final regulatory approval from the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration and the Fish and Wildlife Service. The authorities are currently undertaking a final safety review of the launch vehicle, as well as a review of the environmental impact of the latest upgrades to the Starbase launch site, especially the water deluge system. A Fish and Wildlife Service spokesperson recently stated that their agency received a final biological assessment from the FAA on October 5, and they have up to 30 days to review it. The Fish and Wildlife Service has 135 days to release an amended biological opinion after that 30-day review period. This implies that there's a chance the second integrated flight test won't happen until March 2024. The Fish and Wildlife Service officials have begun inspecting the, the area surrounding the Starbase launch site, along with SpaceX employees. Hopefully, the biological opinion will be released soon. A marine notice for rocket launching operations near Boca Chica Beach from November 1 has been published lately. Backup dates include each day following November 1 until conditions permit the launch. It is important to remember that the date is merely a placeholder for now and should not be treated as an actual launch date. During a U.S. Senate subcommittee hearing on October 18, William Gerstenmayer, vice president for build and flight reliability at SpaceX, testified that the Starship vehicle has been ready to fly for more than a month now, but is still awaiting the necessary government approvals to fly again. It's a shame when our hardware is ready to fly and we're not able to go fly because of regulations or re-review. We need to be safe. We need to protect the environment. We don't dismiss those, but we need to fly at the fastest pace that we can do hardware development. The AST licensing division needs at least twice the resources that they have today. We also recommend expedited hiring authority for AST to onboard additional qualified technical experts with an innovative mindset or to bring in outside help. AST's role is to protect public safety, not to ensure success of rocket launches. When it comes to projects of national interest, such as the Artemis program, Congress should establish a regulatory regime consistent with the national program objectives and schedules. But 33 engines, the staging, all this is new technology. 
we need to test that soon, learn what's wrong, fix it, and go fly again. And we cannot be held up by regulation. So it's hard for me to give a specific date of where we are, but the current pace where regulation is driving, that should not be the case. The burden should be put on us as a private company, put on SpaceX, and let us develop at the fastest pace. We should be the ones that are driving the development, not being driven by regulatory oversight. You can watch the complete U.S. Senate subcommittee hearing from the link given in the description. Several senior SpaceX officials recently discussed with Ars Technica how working with the FAA has hindered progress on the Starship program, as well as advancements with the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft. While the officials commend the FAA's efforts with the resources available, they emphasize the need for a larger licensing team, especially for missions of national importance. According to SpaceX, the company worked for two years to obtain the initial Starship launch license and has been waiting months for the second. They fear that such lengthy reviews will delay future test flights needed to demonstrate Starship's viability, refueling capability, and ability to safely land on the moon. SpaceX plans to launch up to 12 times a month next year and hopes to deploy the next-generation Starlink Internet satellites into orbit with the help of Starships. Therefore, the officials recommend that the FAA seek support from NASA, the U.S. Space Force, and other agencies for assistance in managing the regulatory load it is currently facing. You can read the complete Ars Technica article from the link given in the description. Starship 26 pre-launch tests continue at suborbital pad B. Ship 26 conducted a pre-burner test on Wednesday, October 18. Starship's Raptors consists of two separate closed-cycle gas generators known as pre-burners, which combine methane and liquid oxygen propellant to create a hot gas mixture that the engine reignites to produce thrust. A pre-burner test involves activating those igniters, producing a gentle fireball that won't generate any significant thrust. Pre-burner tests have become increasingly rare as SpaceX's Raptor design matured over the course of several ground testing and flight tests. The last time a pre-burner test was performed at Starbase was two years ago on Starship 20. The Ship 26 pre-burner test may have been conducted to validate the recent upgrade to the current generation Raptor engine. On Friday, October 20, Ship 26 underwent a static fire test with a single Raptor engine. The engine was fired for about six seconds during the test. Static fire tests are carried out to make sure the plumbing, valves, ignition systems, and engines of the vehicle are operating as intended before an actual launch. Ship 26 has been preparing for the static fire test at Pad B for the past 43 days, making it one of the most anticipated tests in recent times. Tests involving two separate starships for the upcoming launch approvals are scheduled for October 22. We might witness a full stack wet dress rehearsal and more Ship 26 tests on Sunday. Super Heavy Booster 11, recently relocated to SpaceX's Massey's facility, has begun its cryogenic proof test campaign. The booster completed its first cryo-proof test on October 13. The test began by partially filling the methane tank of the booster with liquid nitrogen. The loading of the oxygen tank started while the methane tank was detanking. Eventually, both tanks were completely emptied, concluding the test that lasted for more than six hours. Booster 11 conducted its second cryo-test on October 18. This time, the liquid nitrogen had filled the oxygen tank to the brim, and the vehicle was kept like that for the next three hours. As the oxygen tank started to gradually empty, liquid nitrogen pumping into the methane tank commenced. The methane tank was partially filled before detanking to conclude the test, which lasted for more than eight hours. Apart from ensuring the reliability of the plumbing, these types of cryo-proof tests give engineers the valuable data they need to determine if the booster can endure various kinds of stresses during flight and whether the structure has any leaks. Booster 11's predecessor, Booster 10, underwent three cryo-proof tests at Massey's last month before returning to the Starbase production facility. Similarly, we can expect more Booster 11 cryo-proof tests in the coming days. Starship Test Tank 14 underwent a cryoproof test at Massey's on October 19. Test Tank 14 comprises a two-ring forward section and a three-ring aft section with stringers. Both sections are sleeved over elliptical-style domes, or E-domes. Test Tank 14 was built to obtain data to validate the elliptical dome design. Once SpaceX finalizes the elliptical dome design, such domes will replace the older Starship dome designs. Apart from test tanks 14, ship 24.2, and the aft section of ship 27, are currently stationed at Massey's for structural testing. Please watch my previous video to learn about these test tanks and their purposes. Links in the description.
Work on Starships and Super Heavy Boosters designated for future missions is progressing rapidly at the production site. Starships 28 and 29 have completed the cryo-proof test campaign and are being prepared for static fire tests near the rocket garden. The aft flaps for the fully stacked Starship 30 were moved inside the high bay the past week and were eventually installed on the ship. Ship 31 stacking operations were completed two weeks ago and it will now have its aft flaps installed and internal plumbing completed. Both ships 30 and 31 will be subjected to cryogenic proof tests shortly. Ship 32 stacking operations are progressing inside the high bay. The forward dome of the ship was moved into the high bay on October 16. On the 18th, the already stacked payload bay nose cone assembly was lifted and joined with the forward dome. The primary structure of Ship 32 will be completed after three more stacking operations. The fully stacked boosters 10 and 12 are inside the mega bay, and the booster 13 stacking operation is underway next to them. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. In its quest to create a future where millions of people live and work in space, Jeff Bezos' space company, Blue Origin, unveiled plans for a new multi-use, multi-mission spacecraft platform. The Blue Ring platform, being developed by InSpace Systems, a new business unit of Blue Origin, will offer end-to-end -end services, including payload transportation and hosting, refueling and reboosting other orbiting spacecraft, data relay from satellites, and logistics, including an in-space cloud computing capability. The spacecraft can even extend its service to the Cislana region and beyond. The platform consists of a core structure, which houses its hybrid solar electric and chemical propulsion system, two rollout solar arrays, and spacecraft attachment points. The dimensions of the Blue Ring were not yet disclosed, but when stowed, it will be able to fly with any launcher with a 5.4-meter wide fairing. Although Blue Origin has not yet revealed what engines will be used for the new spacecraft, they stated that the engines will not be repurposed from the current engine line of B-3, B-4, or B-7s. According to Blue Origin, the platform can host payloads of more than 3,000 kilograms and provides unprecedented Delta-V capabilities and mission flexibility. The majority of the Blue Ring development units are being manufactured at Blue Origin's Washington headquarters. Blue Ring is designed to operate for five years in space and will serve both commercial and government customers. Blue Origin plans to launch the platform as early as 2025. NASA is busy testing its RS-25 rocket engines for the Space Launch System rocket, which is the backbone of its plans to establish a permanent human presence on the Moon through the Artemis program. The RS-25 cryogenic engines powering the SLS rockets are the same design that flew on the Space Shuttle. NASA modified 16 of the RS-25 engines remaining after the Space Shuttle program for use on Artemis missions 1 through 4. In future missions, beginning with Artemis 5, SLS rockets will use new engines with an upgraded build. The most recent test at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi, which took place on October 17, involved a single RS-25 engine, serial number 0525. This engine has never flown in space, given that it was one of two development engines used for component testing to support shuttle flights. During the test, engineers closely monitored the engine profile, nozzle, hydraulic actuators, turbopumps, valves, and other systems to ensure everything was functioning properly. The engine was operated up to the 111% power level needed during an SLS launch. The hot fire test, which lasted for 550 seconds, marked the first in a series of 12 tests scheduled to stretch into 2024. These kinds of certification test series will provide NASA with the crucial data required to produce an upgraded set of engines for future Artemis missions. Changes made to the newer RS-25 engines will include new manufacturing processes and lighter components that will ultimately result in lower production costs and shorter production times. NASA's Ingenuity Mars helicopter has reached a significant milestone by breaking its ground speed record, marking the fastest it has traveled during a flight. NASA's Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter landed together inside the Jezero crater in February 2021. The rover is hunting for signs of past Mars life and collecting samples for future return to Earth. Ingenuity is aiding those quests by doing scouting work for the Perseverance team. The 1.8-kilogram helicopter completed its 60-second flight on October 12, covering a distance of 268 meters and reaching an altitude of 18 meters in a flight that lasted 121 seconds. The tiny Mars helicopter achieved a ground speed of 10 meters per second, breaking the 8 meter per second record set during its 60th flight last month. Ingenuity was intended to perform five flights on the Martian surface, at altitudes ranging from 3 to 5 meters for up to 90 seconds each, covering distances of nearly 300 meters at a time. 
The mission's flight log shows that Ingenuity has far exceeded its original goals since its maiden flight in April 2021, by completing 62 flights, traveling 13.9 kilometers, and reaching heights of up to 24 meters. NASA has consistently pushed the limitations of flight on another planet with Ingenuity, and with 62 flights and counting, we can expect even more records to be broken in the future. Ingenuity's remarkable achievement showcases the tiny helicopter's immense capabilities and demonstrates aerial exploration is possible on Mars despite its thin atmosphere. It also opens new possibilities for the exploration of the planet and the potential use of aerial vehicles in future scientific endeavors. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.